Welcome to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. I am John Gulliver, and I will introduce the seminar series and our speaker. This series of seminars is co-sponsored by the Water Resources Center and the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, both at the University of Minnesota. The funding for this seminar series comes from the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council. Our speaker today is Stephen Corsi, a research hydrologist at the United States Geological Survey in Madison, Wisconsin. Steve has been performing research with the USGS since 1988, focused primarily on water quality studies, including the evaluation and the, of the effectiveness of non-point source pollution management practices in Wisconsin streams and assessment of biological impact from toxic chemicals and tributaries of the Great Lakes. This included long-term trends of chloride in streams resulting from road salt runoff, pesticides and runoff from urban and agricultural sources, microplastics presence in streams, and prioritization of several hundred organic contaminants observed in the Great Lakes tributaries based on potential for toxicity. <clears throat> in 2010, Steve was a co-author on the article, A Fresh Look at Road Salt, which provided a new perspective on the severity of a, aquatic toxicity impact that road salt has on urban streams. And he has given more than 20 interviews on road salt. He also was a co-author on the article, Additives in Aircraft De-Icers, Anti-Icers, and Waters Receiving Airport Runoff, which was featured on the cover of environmental science and technology with an additional ESNT news story and has changed the monitoring requirements for airport runoff. Finally, the article on plastic debris in the Great Lakes tributaries was the first large scale characterization of microplastics in streams and generated immediate interest with multiple interviews, requests for information, and presentations including a webinar to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Subcommittee on Water Availability and Quality. <laughs> Based on his continued body of research, it is my pleasure to welcome Stephen Corsi. Thank you, John. That's a nice intro. Um, so today I'll talk to you about um, some studies that we've done through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and some of the implications uh, for stormwater quality. So basically we've been prioritizing um, several hundred contaminants of emerging concern, um, monitoring and uh, tributaries re representing all of the Great Lakes. And this has included uh, researchers from multiple different agencies, the EPA, um, the uh, uh, NOAA um, Muscle Watch Program, Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife, um, several different academic institutions, UMD, um, St. Cloud State, um, Central Michigan. And um, so with that, we'll move forward. All of this work has been done in focus area one of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, uh, toxic substances and area of concern, areas of concern. And so of the goals uh, within that focus area, we're, we're primarily interested in the health and integrity of wildlife populations and habitat being protected from uh, chemical and biological effects um, associated with presence of toxic substances and increasing knowledge about these contaminants in Great Lakes fish and wildlife. Primarily what I'll talk about today is the um, identification of emerging contaminants and assessment of potential impacts on Great Lakes fish and wildlife. So a quick overview. Again, I mentioned this is a multi-agency team. There's five federal agencies and three academic institutions uh, involved in all of these studies. Uh, the Great Lakes tributaries are our focus. We've done surveillance of different chemicals of emerging concern uh, since 2010. 
uh, including water sediment and passive samplers. These, uh, and then we've done risk-based screening for prioritization of chemicals. I'll get into that later on. Um, and additionally, things that are not covered in this presentation, but things that I can, you know, I can point you to contacts for these if you're interested. There have been uh, studies on uh, influence of chemicals on tree swallows, mussels, and fish, including uh, USGS in our La Crosse office, uh, the NOAA Muscle Watch Program and Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as well as EPA has done a lot of this work too. And then um, I'll give you a preliminary list of chemicals that we've prioritized from our uh, portion of the study. And I'll talk a bit about broad sources of prioritized chemicals with implications on stormwater management issues. So from the collective group, we've monitored for 683 different compounds in water samples. Okay, and so I'm not talking about sediment yet or fish, but I'm just talking about water samples here. 444 of those chemicals were detected. And the chemical classes included antimicrobial disinfectants, antioxidants, detergent metabolites, dyes and pigments, fire retardants, flame, uh, flavors and fragrances, fuels, hormones, PAHs, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, plastics, additives, solvents, sterols, and some other multi-use chemicals. And on the right, you can see the number of chemicals detected uh, from and, and how many were actually monitored. So we did bias the number of chemicals a bit on pharmaceuticals and pesticides. Uh, because there are a lot of those chemicals present. 176 of 290 pharmaceuticals were present, 165 of 279 pesticides. Uh, most of the PAHs we monitored uh, were detected. Six of seven fire retardants, six of six plastics additives, and then 63 other chemicals of 70 that were monitored. We monitored 354 different sampling locations within the Great Lakes um, as a collective group again, uh, not just USGS, but Fish and Wildlife, EPA, NOAA. Um, and they included a gradient of land use. There's a large diversity of the types of sites here. Uh, so from urban, from very urban, industrial, commercial and such to agriculture, different types of agriculture, livestock, crops, uh, pasture, and to undeveloped forest and wetland sites. There's an uneven sample coverage. We did not monitor for every single uh, chemical at every single site. And some sites we collected many samples, some sites we only collected one or two. Um, but that's a pretty large number of sites and we have a decent feel now for uh, chemical presence in the, at these sites. So as you can imagine, there's some challenges with assessing environmental chemistry results when there are so many sites and so many chemicals to deal with. Uh, so it's really impractical to develop, you know, for us to give resource managers information on, you know, 400 chemicals were detected and here, do something about it, right? That's just impractical. What we need to do is prioritize those chemicals for which ones are potentially ecologically relevant before we uh, move that information on to uh, decision makers and resource managers. So how do we do that? Well, we have three different prioritization objectives from all of our studies chemical prioritization, site prioritization, and biological relevance. Um, so all of these include some degree of biological relevance. Uh, chemical prioritization, basically we start with which chemicals were detected, how many sites did we find them at, and then take the concentrations that we observed and compare them to various water quality benchmarks. Um, it's difficult to come by water quality benchmarks for a lot of these chemicals, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, so for site prioritization, then we look at which chemicals are present, 
and which ones are there at concerning concentrations. And then we can also, uh, at the site level, look at chemical mixtures. So which sites could the potency of these chemicals be increased by co-occurrence of multiple chemicals? And then uh, for biological relevance, this is not quite as well developed as the other two, basically because um, the information is really kind of in its um, early stages. So, uh, but, but there is some information where we can predict uh, what kind of biological pathways are influential. Uh, can the prioritization then include these critical biological pathways? And do chemical mixtures um, interact? How do they interact in biological systems? So are there multiple chemicals that act on the same mode of action and so you can add up the effects of those chemicals. So uh, let's start with prioritization of chemicals in a biological context, okay? So we take the chemicals that we've detected and gather biological effect information from multiple sources and then compare that information um, to the observed concentrations. And so far, um, we found it really useful to look at uh, some of these sources. Water quality guidelines are an obvious place to start, but really there's not too many established water quality guidelines for many of the chemicals that uh, we've been monitoring, um, no surprise. Um, there's screening level values from various agencies, which is kind of a step down from the formality of water quality guidelines. Uh, again, there's not a whole lot of information out there from those, but there's some. Um, and then we take the next step and look into the literature. We've uh, relied heavily on the Ecotax Knowledge Base, which is an EPA-run website, a fabulously useful website, to gather uh, toxicology information from the literature and use that information to compare against our observed concentrations. And then... Um, there's a relatively new method um, that we use to comparing what they call high throughput screening results uh, from the ToxCast program to our concentrations. So that's another EPA run program where they uh, test thousands of chemicals. They've tested more than 9,000 chemicals now with many, many different assays, in vitro assays that look at things like, um, cells and proteins and different ways that the chemicals interact um, with those um, with those types of endpoints. So um, in addition, uh, things that I won't talk about today, but we're still working on as a as a team, pharmaceutical potency levels, um, predicted um, predicted uh, potency based on quantitative structure activity relationships or QSAR. And then we're also bringing persistence and bioaccumulation into the mix um, in this prioritization effort. So for each of these sources of information, we've got you know, what we call benchmarks, the, the, um, the water quality guidelines, the screening level, the ecotox information, and the toxcast information. We get water quality benchmarks from each of those sources and um, so we monitor the chemicals. We use what we call a hazard quotient, which is a very simple concept. We take the observed concentration in our samples divided by the concentration of concern or those benchmarks I just mentioned from all those different sources. And we get kind of a multiple lines of evidence approach then uh, to assess, assess these chemicals and whether uh, there's a potential issue. We can prioritize chemicals and sites with all of those methods. And with the ToxCast method, we can also uh, look at biological targets, like I mentioned. So looking at um, the specific genes that are targeted in those ToxCast assays and using things like the adverse outcome knowledge base to infer what potential um, adverse outcomes might uh, occur um, from exposure to those chemicals. And all of this um, 
is really screening level information. So this is not definitive. You know, if they show up on our priority list, it doesn't mean for sure there are influences. It means that there's these are the chemicals that are most likely to have influence. We really need to go and validate those. So this type of analysis help, helps us identify different endpoints to target, to biological endpoints to target in um, toxicology monitoring. And so this is an example then of one of the studies that we've done. And uh, uh, so we, we monitored in 69 different tributaries for 185 chemicals. We detected 143 of them. Okay, using those hazard quotient methods, um, we can uh, take a look at, uh, across all of the sites and look at, so this one is for the, what we call the exposure activity ratio. That's the hazard quotient for, from the ToxCast database, okay? We can do the same thing with the water quality guidelines and the screening level guidelines and such. Uh, so we find that um, the larger the bar, the more likely there is an impact. And so we can compare among all the sites. And then we do things like, you know, just color the bars by the different types of chemical classes to determine which are the most dominant chemicals at individual sites. You know, you can see that there's a variety of chemical classes that contribute depending on what site you look at. Um, now, some sites or some chemical classes are prevalent among many sites, like, for instance, PAHs, these light blue bars, are prevalent, are prevalent in a lot of sites. Uh, the dark blue, that's herbicides, and mostly that's atrazine and metolachlor showing up here. That's in a lot of these sites, especially Western Lake Erie, where there's a whole lot of agriculture. Some of the Wisconsin sites there, where there's uh, quite a bit of agriculture, some of the main sites, uh, and so on. So um, no surprise, the southern half of Lake Michigan and the western portion of Lake Erie seem to have the greatest effects. So. Um, this is the type of analysis we're doing with all of these studies, and we've done multiple different studies now with different chemical classes and a uh, different list of sites each time to, to um, target specific contaminants. Um, but then we also look at chemical mixtures, and this is the one slide I'm going to talk about chemical mixtures uh, in a little more detail. And then to get more information, we have publications, and if you're interested in that, I can point you to them. So uh, mixtures analysis is based on biological pathway annotations in the ToxCast database. So only the ToxCast um, set of uh, benchmarks can be used for this analysis uh, as opposed to the, the, uh, the other three that we've been using. Um, but we can estimate mixture effects by summing the hazard quotients or the, the EARs that I, I mentioned, exposure activity ratios from the tax cast analysis. And when there's common biological functions, like if we're talking about several chemicals that have a response in the very same assay, those certainly can be added together for a mixture effect. Um, if there's multiple assays that have the same gene target, well, those can also be added together for a mixture effect. And then we can take the gene targets and look at the adverse outcome pathway knowledge base to determine are there adverse outcome pathways defined? And if there are, if we have common AOPs, then we can add up those effects. So there's different ways we can do this mixtures analysis. We've devised a couple of R packages in order to help us with all of this analysis. Uh, it gets a little overwhelming. You can't really do it well in a tax in an Excel spreadsheet, for instance. Um, Toxival is designed for the individual chemical analysis. Tox Mixtures takes um, the Toxival uh, uh, input files and then runs a mixtures analysis using these concepts. And um, in addition, the Toxival R package can also use potency from any of those other chosen sources, the water quality guidelines, the ecotox literature, 
information, or obviously it can be used uh, with ToxCast as well. So you can input your own set of um, water quality benchmarks uh, to do the ToxiVal analysis. You don't have to just use ToxCast. So uh, making a long story a little shorter, I'm, rep I'm, I'm boiling this down into, of all those studies that we've done, um, 683 chemicals. We determined that about 70% of the chemicals were not necessary. We're not looking to have high potential for biological effects. Okay, that doesn't mean there aren't some effects in certain instances, but in our analysis, about 70% of them didn't didn't rise to the top. T about 20% of them still couldn't be evaluated because there wasn't information in any of those sources we looked at. And we ended up with 64 priority chemicals identified. Um, actually, it's a bit more than that. Uh, for instance, atrazine has transformation products. We just called that one chemical. Um, and metolachlor had transformation products that showed up. We called that only one chemical. Um, but this is, again, I'll repeat this a few times. This is a screening level assessment. So. Um, this boils it down into these chemicals as the most likely to have adverse effects of all the 683 that we monitored. It's not a verification that there are effects. So further work needs to be done to verify it. Toxicology work, uh, some possibly lab work, possibly uh, in situ work. And um, we really need to do that as a follow-up to these studies to validate our conclusions or to, to, to prioritize this further actually and reduce this list. So, I mean, 64 chemicals is still a lot to pass on to a resource manager and say, okay, what are you gonna do about these, right? Um, so <clears throat> that was for water samples. We've done a similar process, slightly different for sediment, but the priority list comes down to this for sediment samples. We, we monitored 71 streams and 26 Great Lakes tributaries, uh, and then um, 87 chemicals. 74% of those chemicals were at priority level three or below, meaning they weren't a high priority. Um, and 38% of them couldn't be evaluated because we just didn't have information for them. We ended up with 21 priority level one or two chemicals identified, 14 of them were PAHs. Um, so PAHs are pretty prominent here in the sediment, which again is no surprise. Um, but again, these are screen screening level assessments, just like for the water sample, so they need to be verified. Uh, and the reason we did it this way, rather than coming up with just one priority list, is that there were a whole lot of the chemicals that exceeded some of our, our guidelines or benchmarks. And we had to kind of put them in levels of exceedance. And so priority one and two had greater levels of exceedance than uh, priority level three. So this has been published earlier this year, actually, so you can uh, look up if you're more interested in the sediment. So, now let's talk about sources. Where do these things come from? Well, uh, a lot of them come from stormwater, and that's probably why I'm speaking here today. Uh, fire retardants, PAHs, pesticides, plastic components, detergent metabolites. Um, this is just from the list of prioritized contaminants, okay? I'm just uh, focusing on, on that list right now. So certainly there's other contaminants there, but these are the ones that rose to the top. For agricultural runoff, pesticides um, are there. Certainly there are other contaminants in both of these sources, um, but these are kind of like major broad sources. I'm, I'm making a broad sweep at this for now. And then uh, some of the prioritized contaminants were uh, obviously from wastewater effluent, fire retardants, flavors and fragrances, uh, antimicrobials, pharmaceuticals, hormones, plastic components, detergent metabolites. Um, those are all really kind of sewage related contaminants, okay? But now I ask the question, would you expect to see them when there isn't 
sewage that's expected to be in your in your uh, sampling area. And I'm going to give you some information to answer that question now. Okay. So we did a different study back in 2011 to 2013. Um, and then another study for the next few years. And we really uh, have done probably this is this represents maybe about 10 years of monitoring in different types of studies, different areas. But we're bringing it all together um, as an assessment of uh, some of this it's microbial source tracking data for human sewage. Okay, human bacteria, human bacteroides, and lactobacilli are hu human specific markers, and so they're sewage indicators. So, unless you see sewage contamination in your watershed, you wouldn't likely see high high uh, concentrations of these. Okay, so these box plots, the red is the event sample, so runoff, snow melt, and rainfall runoff, and the blue boxes are low flow samples, okay? Now, I'm highlighting the sites with the most urban influence. Now I'm gonna give you a second to take a look at this and pick out the pattern, okay, between the box plots. I'm sure you've all picked it out by now. The event samples are greater at the urban sites than the low flow samples are. Whereas if you go outside the urban boxes, you don't see that the same is true, okay? That's a stormwater influence. So we're seeing sewage in our stormwater, right? This is a pretty clear indication that urban runoff has sewage influence. Okay, I'm gonna go a step further here. We did another study where we monitored these microbial source tracking uh, human markers for a full year in the Menominee River in the Milwaukee area, okay? And what we did was we developed a regression equation between um, optical sensor data and these microbial source tracking markers so that we were able to monitor continuously using the optical sensors and then predict sewage presence or the MST markers. And what we see um, you know, I just want you to pick out two patterns here from this graph. First off, the hydrologic influence. I don't have flow on here, but I'll tell you, all of these bumps here like this, these are hydrologic events. These bumps here, these bumps, all of these are hydrologic events, so snow melt or rainfall. Now, the blue bars indicate when there was a CSO, a combined sewer overflow influence. So no surprise that there's sewage in the stream at that time but none of the other periods have CSO influence, they still do see a hydrologic event influence. So that's again, an indication that we have stormwater contributing sewage. But even during low flow periods, um, we do see some sewage influence, okay? Um, it's just greater during stormwater periods. Uh, so, and then there's also a seasonal influence. You can see the numbers are greater in the colder weather period than they are during the middle of the summer. And there's a number of reasons that could be, one of them being hydrology as well, uh, because you do have more saturated soil conditions in uh, cold weather periods than you do in uh, warm weather periods. So greater connectivity of the shallow groundwater system and where leaking sewage pipes might leak to Right, um, and so a couple things, hydrologic influence and seasonal influence there. But we do, the bottom line is we do have sewage in our urban streams. And one more study to nail down this point, uh, some of our colleagues in USGS did a study of 21 urban stormwater conveyance systems around the country. So they're outside of the Great Lakes area now, they're around the whole country. And they measured 438 organic chemicals, similar list of the types of chemicals we've been monitoring. And here's what they found. Um, this is the number of detected organic chemicals on the y-axis for every site, which is on the x-axis. And the different colors are the different 
types of the different classes of contaminants that they detected. But let's take a closer look at this legend here and see prescription drugs 5%, non prescription drugs 7% of the chemicals, household chemicals 13% of the chemicals detected, industrial chemicals 14% of the chemicals detected. Those are all things that you wouldn't really expect to see unless there's sewage contamination in, in your stormwater, right? So it's another clear indication that we've got sewage contamination in our stormwater. Okay, so what does that do then? Of the three different boxes that I showed you earlier, urban stormwater, agricultural stormwater, wastewater treatment plant effluent uh, as the source, we can take wastewater treatment plant effluent chemicals and also add them to the urban stormwater mix, right? Because basically there's imperfect infrastructure in our sewage treatment conveyance, in our sewage conveyance system. There's misconnections and there's also um, breaks and leaks and such. So what do we do about that uh, in the stormwater world? Well, um, treatment and removal of organic chemicals is complex. You probably all understand that very well. Uh, even wastewater treatment plants have difficulty fully removing many organic chemicals. So can we be expected to design stormwater management options for removal of organics? Um, it's a challenge. So uh, certainly particle associated contaminants like PAHs, for instance, can be removed uh, by traditional GI practices that rely on filtration or settling. Um, but removable or soluble contaminants is a big challenge. And I'm talking to the choir here. You're a stormwater, you're, you're all stormwater professionals, so you know this. Um, but uh, one of our panel members, in fact, has worked on this extensively. And hopefully she'll talk a little bit about that in the panel discussion, what custom filter media or soil amendments might be needed to help remove some of these soluble contaminants. But also part of the stormwater treatment system is actually a wastewater infrastructure repair, you know, fixing these leaking and failing pipes and misconnections uh, goes a long way to, um, to treat uh, those types of contaminants or remove those types of contaminants from the stormwater system. And there's programs all over the country in every urban area to try and do that. It's a real difficult process. So in summary, um, we identified priority chemicals based on this nine-year interagency uh, contaminant of emerging concern monitoring effort uh, using multiple lines of evidence. Uh, 70 to 90 percent of the monitored compounds don't indicate evidence of potential risk to aquatic life. Um, the prioritized compounds require closer examination to verify risk. Um, did I tell you that these are screening level analyses? Well, that's still true. So. Uh, Five chemical use classes really stand out, PAHs, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, flame retardants, and plastics components. Um, and we're moving forward with additional analysis with the interagency team. So the one thing I just wanted to mention is that, you know, this is really about protecting the future of our water quality resources. There's been a lot of work done on legacy contaminants like PCBs and mercury and such. These are the next generation of contaminants that we need to deal with. And so um, this is what we're doing to try to improve the future of our water resources. Um, but really, you know, there's a lot of questions. How will this information be used? Who will use it? What are appropriate actions to reduce the impacts? You we need to identify more specific sources than those broad sources that I talked about. We need to talk about critical time periods. Is it snow melt? Is it rainfall? Is it base flow? Um, and then in the end, are there resources and is there motivation to implement remedial actions that'll make a difference here? You know, the intention, of course, for all of us is to provide a base of information for future water resources management. So uh, these are all of our partners on the project. Uh, I mentioned them earlier and there's a list of publications that we use for our CEC prioritization through GLRI. Um, feel free to ping me, I'll send you this list if you want. And um, of course, this is one of the big reasons 
we're doing all this work is to you know preserve resources like this. So take any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. The applause from one person. <laughs> Thanks, um, John. Yeah, we have um, uh, one question and, and one statement from the audience. And, and please add your questions into the question and answer uh, slot. Uh, here's a question from Dana Copeland. I didn't see PFAS compounds in your list of target organic chemicals. Did I just miss PFAS on your list? If not, why were PFAS not included in your target list of organics? Yeah, good question, Dana. We just haven't got it on the list yet. We're, um, we've got a bunch of PFAS data from 60 some sites that we've monitored. We're in the middle of doing that analysis and um, writing publications. And so um, we're getting there. Um, and it, I just haven't had a point, had a chance to, um, and we haven't finalized it. So that will certainly be in there eventually. Okay, here's another uh, a question or comment from uh, Mark Ferry. He says, to what extent do you think that these contaminants in stormwater could be due to atmospheric deposition? These have been observed in precipitation in other studies. Yeah, no doubt there's a, a lot of information in atmospheric deposition and um, at least some of these chemicals, and that's a potential source for sure. Uh, we haven't done studies on that, so I can't say a whole lot about which ones uh, might, might be prevalent in atmospheric deposition and where that's a significant source versus um, urban runoff, ag runoff, or wastewater treatment plants, but good question, Mark. Uh, here's a, a question from Ben Janke. Do you have a sense for how much of the human-derived contaminants are coming from failing infrastructure versus just not being treated by the wastewater treatment plant? Um, put another way, how many of the sampling sites are downstream versus upstream of wastewater treatment plant effluent locations? Yeah, that's a good question too. Uh, in a, our, the pharmaceuticals portion of our study, we did a, an analysis, um, I don't have that graph here, but that's a, a publication I can point you to, uh, where we uh, compared the total pharmaceutical concentration to um, the percent of flow as wastewater treatment effluent. And there's a pretty decent relation there. So that's, you know, obviously the major source is wastewater treatment effluent. But there was enough scatter in that relation um, that indicated there's other sources as well. That's not you know, the only source. I'd say it's the primary source. And I don't have a number for you as far as a percentage of uh, those chemicals and the loading from those chemicals from wastewater treatment versus failing infrastructure. But um, certainly, they're both sources. And wastewater treatment effluent is uh, more dominant than the failing infrastructure is. OK, now here's a, a question from Greg Lefebvre. Do you think that there is a broader suite of organics that are in agricultural stormwater than just traditional pesticides? He's thinking about hormones, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Absolutely, no doubt, Greg. Uh, another good question. We didn't get into that. Um, you know, we had so many resources and it's one thing that um, we weren't able to address, but yeah, there's been a fair bit of research on agricultural uh, organic contaminants and, and certainly there's more than pesticides. Um, here's another question from uh, James Lenhart. What is the long-term fate of these compounds over time once captured in media based in treatment systems in general, of course? That's, that's a great question. Um, and I'm guessing that some of our panel members might be able to answer that better than, than I, um, given that they've had experience, uh, more direct experience um, studying these things in, in uh, stormwater treatment systems. So I'm gonna defer that to the panel and, and, and leave that question for when we move on to the panel discussion. Okay. Well, I've got some questions for you. Um, first, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the potential for bioeffect 
And, and uh, I understand the River Rouge because I've been on that river uh, multiple times um, and um, pretty close to the water. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, pretty hazardous actually. But I'm wondering about Indiana, HC1, Maumee, and Rocky. What's going on? Because they're quite a bit higher than all of the rest of the sites. Yeah, Indiana Harbor Canal is um, a pretty well-recognized um, spot where there's a fair bit of contamination from industrial sources. That's right in the right in the heat of uh, the industry down in the south east of Chicago. And so it's an um, AOC in the, it's an area of concern in the Great Lakes. And there's a lot of work being done as far as remediation is concerned. Um, so that's, um, it was no surprise to see numbers higher at, uh, at Indiana Harbor Canal, given its history. Uh, and then the Maumee River is, you know, known for being a very highly agricultural basin. Not only that, it's about 90 some percent um, tile drainage in that basin. And so the chemicals that get spread, uh, the pesticides in particular, um, have a pretty direct connection to the river. Um, they go you know, through the top soil layer into the, into the drain tiles and directly out to the river. And it's really agricultural. So um, there are you know, those chemicals being applied in uh, a large percentage of the basin. And then some of the other chemicals, there are urban areas within the Maumee River as well, but pesticides was really the, the key player in the Maumee Basin. Yeah, I was surprised that was so much higher than the other agricultural basins. And, and well, I don't know what the site, uh, the River Rocky is. Rocky is in um, is in Ohio. It's a um, it drains to into the western Lake Erie uh, basin, and there's a fair bit of urban and some agriculture in the Rocky River Basin. Yeah. So when I look at sources, uh, I didn't, and, and you were looking at the sources, I didn't see any herbicides in your um, list of chemicals that you were looking for. And, and why, why is that? Are they less? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of herbicides in there. Um, let me go back up here to yeah. just the, yeah. here. So herbicides that showed up on the priority list are here. Yeah. Okay. We did, you know, herbicides, insecticides, and also fungicides. And so, it, you know, the herbicides and insecticides kind of were more prominent than the fungicides were um, as far as uh, hazard quotients. But I was thinking in the 64 that you were looking for, there were no herbicides there. The 64 priority chemicals? Yeah, uh, the, uh, not the 64 priority chemicals, but in this, in the 64 that you said, okay, we looked at these in detail. Hmm, I'm there not- There were no herbicides there. There are pesticides and maybe herbicides were kind of um, moved in with the pesticides. Oh, you mean in this graph? Yeah, no, a couple later than that. Okay. Or the sediment. Oh, okay. I thought it was sediment, right? Right. Um, yeah, that's another thing. The sediment is really focused on particle-associated contaminants, and so many of the herbicides are soluble, so they're not really going to show up in this uh, in this study as a highly prominent. So, I'd like to tell everybody: if you have another question, please ask the question. We have one one thing from uh, Greg Lefever. Again, he says, one thing that I always wonder is considering the potential for interactive effects of complex exposure mixtures to organisms like synergistic, antagonistic, et cetera. Can you comment on this potential for the complex mixtures 
in the framework of tox mixtures screening? Yeah, no doubt. That's a great question, Greg. So, um, and that's why we put so much effort into, you know, developing that R package and doing analysis for a number of our studies. And um, so it's, it's not simple, obviously, and that's why it's not done too often. Um, there's certainly uh, an emphasis by some researchers on complex mixtures. So um, there, there and, and our analysis focuses on um, similar modes of action, right? So when we can identify chemicals that have similar modes of action, we can add up their hazard quotients. And we did that a fair bit. Um, it, it usually turns out that one chemical is kind of the dominant one and you have a couple of ones that add up you know, 10 or 20% more of the hazard quotient, something like that. But it was really common that one chemical kind of dominated that mixture effect, like, you know, from 50 to 80% of the actual hazard quotient was from just one chemical, and then the other ones added incremental amounts. Um, but the, the one thing that that doesn't include and could be really important is when you have a certain chemical in a specific mode of action that has an effect that's sublethal, okay? And then you have another chemical that's a different mode of action. Well, that'll have a mixture effect as well because, you know, possibly the immune system is having some troubles from the first chemical and the second chemical, maybe it doesn't take as high a concentration to have an effect. Now, we can't predict that um, using the methods that we're using, um, that would have to be, you know, in vitro or in vivo effects um, testing. And um, uh, there was some of that done in another part of the study. I don't have that information there, but Heiko Schoenfuss uh, and his group did um, several studies on like an urban mixture and an agricultural mixture and uh, their publications in the, uh, on, on um, that topic uh, from, from this team that I could point you to uh, if interested as well. But yeah, it, it could be certainly a, a, an effect in, and um, uh, we're kind of in the infancy of really understanding mixture effects, I think. It's really complex. Okay, thank you. So, so Stephen, um, Michael Ferry, uh, Mark Ferry asked another question. Uh, Alan Kolek and his group have seemed to indicate that these chemicals in sediment have a greater biological effect than those found in surface water alone. Do you have any thought on the relative risk between chemicals found in sediments versus the chemicals found in surface water? Are they the same risk? Yeah, really interesting question. Uh, so in our studies, we found that uh, the hazard quotients were greater in our sediment studies for sure. So, you know, there's whether you can make the statement that there's greater risk from sediment than water from our studies, I'm not certain because they're different types of exposures. Um, the chemicals we find in sediment aren't as bioavailable as ones in water. And so we've tried to estimate um, poor water concentrations from those sediment studies. And um, and then we also uh, we're currently in the midst of analysis of a study where we use passive samplers in the pore water uh, and compared to passive sampler results in the water column. Uh, we're, we're not done with that analysis, so I can't really make much uh, conclusions from that. But, um, you know, some of the information we're seeing could support that notion that sediment is possibly more influential than water. But then again, it's all about what the organism, where the organisms live, um, what's the exposure mechanism and such, and then how bioavailable are the chemicals in the sediment? So it's, it's not an easy answer. Uh, yeah, I think that's really true. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm kind of interested in microplastics because it's a, uh, it's a material of interest these days. 
I haven't seen much on toxicity of plastic components. Uh, and my question is, uh, do, you, do you happen to know what research has been done on microplastics? Um, any on, on the toxicity, these types of things? Well, I can tell you this, I'm not going to, I mean, this um, toxicity of microplastics hasn't been a focus for us, but I can tell you I'm familiar enough to know that there's a ton of research being done right now. It's a, it's a blossoming field of research, and there's a number of researchers that have done a lot of work on this. And again, it's, it's another really complex thing because microplastics aren't just one contaminant. Microplastics are multiple contaminants all under that one umbrella. Each, each plastic component has the original polymer, but it also has additives in it that could leach from the plastic and have an effect. Um, it also, you know, some chemicals could sorb to the plastic um, just like they do to sediment. Uh, so there's a lot of factors involved there and really to thoroughly study toxicity of microplastics, it's, you know, this huge field um, and they would need to look at all the individual polymers, the shapes of the plastics can make a difference, the size of the plastics can make a difference, all the different additives that are included can make a difference. So um, as, as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a field that's going to be um, moving forward over quite a number of years. Yeah, I, as I, I've said, I think you have your work cut out for you and this is more than a career of work uh, on these uh, CECs. No doubt. Uh, Sarah Niedrich has a question. She said, if you had to pick one of the 64 chemicals listed to work on as a water resource manager, which one would you pick and why? <laughs> Good question. Um, so here's the, water, here's the water list. And then there's the sediment list. I mean, it depends on where you are um, and what your watershed is. So I know I'm 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 going to be a politician here and 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 dance around that question, but uh, in some cases and in, in dense urban areas where um, coal tar sealants are applied, I'd say PAHs would be my number one. Um, in cases where uh, coal tar sealants aren't an issue. Um, well, let me let me ex let me just mention that we have a PAH study in areas where coal tar sealants have been banned, and we're still seeing evidence of coal tar sealant prevalence in stream sediments. Um, let's see, it was 2007. It was banned in Dane County here where I live, and we're still seeing. Um, that as the dominant source of PAHs in our stream sediments. So um, even after it's been banned, um, they, they remain. So that, that's a big one. Um, but then obviously in agricultural areas, there could be others. We, are, we really um, didn't look at specific ones other than pesticides, but there's some pesticides that could be, um, could be a real high priority in agricultural areas. And then um, there's a number, BPA seems to show up a lot in a lot of places and at levels that we found concerning. So that's another one. Uh, nonophenol, the same thing. So um, there's a few anyways. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, Steve. Um, like I said, you have your work cut out for you. And, and, and we're, the thing is that we're producing these chemicals continuously uh, in society. And so it's not going to stop unless we stop the way that we introduce them into the environment and then find out later what the impacts are. Yep. And then there's new ones all the time. Like Dana mentioned, the PFAS is really prevalent right now and requires its own full presentation to this group. <laughs> 
So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to present to this uh, this crew. Um, it's been it's been great for me. Thanks. Okay, great. And we will have a, a panel discussion um, with with Steve and three uh, well known panelists uh, in a five minutes. So that starts at eleven o'clock. So take a break, then come back at eleven. The panel discussion will start then. Welcome back everyone to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. My name is Andy Erickson. It's my privilege to moderate the panel discussion that we're gonna dive right into. Uh, I'll ask our panelists to go ahead and start sharing their videos. I will introduce them one by one and ask them to give their relation to the topic and then we'll dive into questions. So if you have questions for our local panel members or more questions for Steve, Please post those in the Q&A box and we'll get to those as soon as we possibly can. So I'm gonna start by introducing our first panelist who is David Fairbairn. David Fairbairn is a senior water quality analyst and natural resource specialist at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And he's also a returning Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series panelist. So thanks for joining us again, David. David, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic? Hi, Andy and everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, to this topic, I guess I began working with CECs um, about 12 years ago or so, 2009, 2010, and um, looking at mixtures, although they were much smaller numbers of chemicals at that time, because we were working with the university labs and developing the methods. Uh, sort of on the fly for these mixtures. Um, and so I guess, you know, I started out really excited about what the analytical capabilities for the chemistry and, you know, uh, finding these different mixtures and, you know, finding out what has been detected all over, you know, the world and these various localities and seeing some commonalities amongst detections. But um, as I got more and more into it, I became to you know, understand the need to put some kind of you know relevance to these these measures and just because you find something that sounds you know like a scary chemical you know at some concentration you know and the fact that you can detect it at such small you know levels and um doesn't necessarily provide a context for the environmental you know and human health relevance of it all um and there were obviously early studies that were looking at sort of comparative estrogenicity um and started to get these benchmarks and showing you know um effects on animal populations at very low levels, but the more chemicals you find and the different um, mechanisms of action that they have uh, just it gets really uh, just overwhelming to consider like how to actually understand all this and, and, and what to pick out as being, um, you know, of note, especially when you consider legalities of things. And if you're going to start to try to pinpoint actors for regular regulation or try to tell, you know, businesses to stop producing certain chemicals, um, for example, uh, you really need to be able to have sort of that smoking gun and the complexity of environmental mixtures and the, the numbers of chemicals that are potential players uh, really make that difficult. And um, so I guess as time has gone on, I've been sort of tracking as not, you know, as toxicologist focused myself, but, you know, somewhat um, the inclusion of these types of bioassays and development of, um, you know, sort of more sublethal bioassays and mechanistic bioassays and, you know, genetic assays and molecular assays that can start to pair the changes to biological mechanisms um, and link those to, you know, specific chemical occurrences, hopefully, and, and, and tie them to biological outcomes. And so, um, I guess I'm just been following this effort, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and as Steve mentioned, you know, there's a lot of biological assessments that have gone along with these same sites, and it's a really great coordinated effort that involves a lot of, you know, um, spearheaded by national agencies, and there's good money going towards it, and it's involving a lot of local experts and regional experts, and uh, I think that that's totally necessary in order to take this level, you know, understanding of these chemicals to the next level and put them in sort of maybe a regulatory context. Um, you know, something we can take action on. So it's very exciting and glad to be here. And it was a great talk. So thanks, Steve. Thanks, David. That's great. Our next panelist is Bridget Ulrich, who is the Environmental Chemistry Research Program Leader at the Natural Resources Research Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Bridget, from your background, perspective, and experience, how do you relate to this topic? <laughs> 
Um, thanks, Andy, and also thanks, Steve, for the great talk. And my connection to this topic is really multifaceted, so I was excited that when I saw that the stormwater seminar series was going to be focusing on contaminants and the Great Lakes. Um, so my research is focused on both CECs and stormwater, as well as in the Great Lakes. And when I started my PhD 10 years ago, um, and my project was focused on removal of CECs from stormwater, I more than once got the question of why my research was relevant because these compounds aren't regulated, they're never gonna be regulated, why do people care? And I always said, well, people care because these compounds can cause ecological harm. So someday, you know, I always thought somebody's going to care. So I'm really excited that here we are caring about CECs and stormwater. Um, and since I'm a Minnesota native, I was really, I, I was in Colorado for my PhD where there's a lot less water, um, but a lot of stormwater when it rains. And I was excited to be able to come back to Minnesota for this position at NRI in Duluth. And since I've been here, I've been able to get involved in um, working on the Great Lakes and contaminants in the Great Lakes. So um, our interdisciplinary team in Duluth has a cooperative agreement with the US EPA to monitor legacy and emerging contaminants in Great Lakes sediments. So uh, as I've moved more from the treatment side to the analytical monitoring side, I've really come to appreciate the various levels of effort that go from that come in when you're going from analyzing 10 contaminants to 100 contaminants. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the topic today because I feel like it unites two really important topics and um, I'm very honored to be able to be on this panel. So thank you. Excellent, thank you, Bridget. Uh, our next panelist is Keith Pilgrim, who is a senior water resources specialist at Bar Engineering and also a returning Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series panelist. So thanks for joining us again, Keith. From your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Thanks, Andy, and uh, thanks, Steve, for that nice presentation. It stimulated a lot of thought <clears throat> in my mind. Um, so I get my position at Bar, I do about half my workload is is working on municipal or industrial effluent toxicity, and other half is probably stormwater based or uh, lake restoration type type work. And um, sometimes I get involved in doing monitoring projects and called you know invertebrate monitoring things like that. So, so everything you touched on, Steve, kind of ticks in my head. I you know oftentimes I'm doing these wastewater treatment, wastewater toxicity evaluations, not treatment evaluation, but toxicity evaluations. And I do see a lot of these chemicals come up, right? And oftentimes they're not the ones that necessarily cause the toxicity to the aquatic organisms. So like uh, Ceridaph nubia is uh, the main test organisms for uh, most compliance in, in the United States for industrial and municipal wastewater and its chronic or acute toxicity. I've been stumped a couple times. And so I always wonder what else is in there when I couldn't figure it out. Um, for the most part, it's been simple things, ammonia, metals, uh, chloride, potassium, things like that. And every once in a while, I think, oh, caffeine. So I was doing work downstream of a, a, a brewery that makes monster drinks, right? And it goes to a special effluent. I thought, caffeine's got to be it. And then it's not caffeine. So a lot of times I see these chemicals come through, and I think maybe this is the, the toxicant. Uh, but it often ends up being something, something simpler. But, you know, if I think back to my days as a grad student, right, I took uh, invertebrate samples all over the state of Minnesota. And it's obvious to me that if you take a sample in Minneapolis or St. Paul at a small stream versus up in Itasca State Park, you're gonna see different organisms, you're gonna see different biodiversity. And so even though it's hard to detect the, the direct impacts of all the different uh, constituents or pollutants in our, our stormwater or municipal wastewater, there's obviously some kind of you know low level stress going on. So this additive toxicity is clearly 
impact. And I think about that a lot because oftentimes the toxicity is never is often you know several constituents acting together to cause a greater toxic effect than you'd expect them alone. So that's kind of how I relate to this this conundrum of of uh, how to interpret all this data. And then the third way I relate to it is occasionally I get involved in stormwater treatment. Um, you know, just like David does, and he, we've had some conversations. And there are certain treatments that can take out these are synthetic organics, right? So, but they're not they're not easy, and they're fairly large. And so, the, the question of how to start tackling uh, this is is a big one. So that's kind of how I relate to this subject. That's great, Keith. Thank you so much. Uh, so I won't ask for Steve's relation because he set us up with the keynote presentation. So I'm going to dive into some questions. Again, for you, the audience, this is your opportunity to get your questions asked and answered, ideally, um, from our panelists, from our local panelists here in Minnesota, but also from Steve. So you have more questions there. Um, I'm going to dive in, actually, kind of building off of what Keith was just saying and, and get into lessons learned. Right. So today we're talking about prioritizing chemicals and chemical mixtures and how do we optimize our analysis for these water quality samples? How do we look for certain things? So I, I want to dive into what are some of the lessons our panelists have learned from their experience, not only on the chemical analysis side, complex mixture side, but even just from water quality monitoring programs. I know a lot of our audience are stormwater practitioners. They have monitoring programs. We had the question. Uh, earlier during the presentation, if you could pick one, which one would it be? Um, that's like picking your favorite child or your favorite pet. <laughs> I can imagine being a difficult question, but what are some of the lessons you panelists have learned uh, from your experience in this realm? I can jump in if it's uh, if somebody wants to start. Uh, from, I guess, a regulatory agency standpoint to um, with MPCA. Um, and that is, I said, it, just to reiterate, you know, um, kind of making a sense of, of all the noise and the real need to do that. And, um, you know, to be able to, to relate this message as we always, you know, sometimes struggle with, or it's a challenge with, uh, you know, outward facing summaries, but, you know, um, to be able to encapsulate the important stuff, not, not just for you know our administration or for decision makers, but also for the public, um, and to not just you know it's easy to just overwhelm with all this information about all the you know, and so um, I guess some of the, a couple of the basic lessons that I've learned is that um, you know and just some of this from you know the few studies that I've really worked on in relation to stormwater and CECs are you know that we did a study of um, iron and hand sand filters and we're still producing. Um, publications on the toxicity of the ecotox of that, as well as the chemical removal. And, um, you know, some of these treatment systems, they work as predicted for hydrophobic compounds. And in other cases, you know, you see some benefits uh, in the case of the iron enhancement, uh, we think because of uh, non-hydrophobic interactions where the electrochemistry of the iron enhanced sand filter actually attracts some sort of um, non-polar molecules like caffeine and acetaminophen um, and does some affects some removal of that. Um, and then, definitely um, to try to include this bioassay and, and sort of biological component, you know, and so some of the work we've done, uh, it's, it involves getting more than just yourself, you know, involved in and getting a, a group of people together that really know what they're doing. And it's okay. To, 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 it's beneficial to do it like that, you know, like I've worked with Heiko Schoenfuss on a couple of studies and, um, and Dalma Martinovich and you know, so pairing this chemical assays with some of the sort of newer bioassays um, that can look at these mechanisms or, you know, sub lethal effects and changes to the organism that, and, you know, kind of pairing that with the um, more conventional toxicity outcomes, looking at, you know, offspring numbers and sex counts for daphnia and or for fish and whatnot, um, really helps get at that whole bigger picture thing. And I think helps be able to sort of speak to the ultimate meeting at the end of such a complex project. Cool. And um, I can jump in and maybe use this as an opportunity to maybe not talk about a lesson learned from the chemical analysis, but from the treatment, the treatment side of things, since I, I see from the questions, there's some interest in that. And, um, you know, the one of the hardest things about the CECs is that they're dissolved and they're not removed easily in treatment systems. 
So even with conventional mixtures with soil and bioretention media, they don't they don't seem to be removed as well as, um, for example, PAHs, which tend to just to stick to that conventional material better. So you really need to add something more to those systems if you want to get removal of some of these emerging contaminants that just seem to be more mobile in treatment systems. So um, there's a couple different materials you can use for that. We've done a lot of work with biochar, which is a um, charcoal-like material that's produced from pyrolysis of biomass. Um, and what, what I learned is that even if all the biochars look like this black powder, they can be very, very different for their ability to remove organic contaminants from runoff. And there's not really an easy way to just make a quick measurement and say, yes, this, this material is going to work. Or even a way to say, okay, it was produced with this material at this temperature, it should work because there's such a diversity of production processes. So what I really learned is that you need to just do a some screening of different materials and do some quick tests to actually confirm that that material works. And sometimes even on a batch by batch basis as a sort of performance, um, you know, QA, QC test. And you don't need to do LCMS and have a complicated list of contaminants to determine if that one material is useful for removing a variety of organic contaminants. So you can do a simple, like a test that's as simple as, you know, dissolving some organic matter from soil, filtering it so you can see that, that it's brown, put it in a tube with some biochars at the same amount, and you can tell visibly if some work better than the other. So, you know, just doing those simple screening level tests to see if your material that you're choosing works before you invest all this time and effort, um, you know, breaking ground and installing it in a system is is really important. So, uh, I'll I'll give that as my most important lesson learned for today. So. Other lessons learned. So I'm going to move into that. I want to kind of build off of both of those answers from Bridget and David and uh, go, actually go back to a question that we had during Steve's talk on, okay, if we use biochar or if we use some other media, iron enhanced sand or something to remove these pollutants from the water, what, what do we expect out of that media then long-term? What is that long-term fate? Obviously it's going to depend on the chemical. It's going to depend on the, the bonding chemistry and what's going on there, but is this, I'm not aware of a lot of research on that. So do we have, is there anything out there in literature? Is there anything we know right now about what we will need to do with these materials long-term or what we can expect from these chemicals? Cool. So I can jump in on that. Um, and I know Greg is here and he could easily be a panelist and answer this, this question as well. So Greg, feel free to chime in in the, in the, the chat box. Um, but yeah, so unlike metals, these contaminants can degrade. Um, however, under ambient environmental conditions, many of them degrade very slowly. And oftentimes when they degrade, they're not necessarily becoming fully mineralized. They become transformation products that oftentimes are more mobile in treatment systems. So the degradation isn't necessarily good if it's slow because it, it's also possible that those transformation products are more harmful than the original compound. So it, I mean, the first part of the answer is they can degrade, but slowly. And I think some one important direction that this research is going is trying to figure out how to accelerate that degradation. So when it does happen, it results in mineralization within a time frame that um, prevents those transformation products from passing through the treatment system and into receiving waters. So um, this is a an area where Greg could you know chime in about talking about fungi or other 
other ways that we can try to really stimulate that degradation past the ambient environmental conditions um, to, to prevent those problems. So the, the question I saw when that question got posted, I said, oh, I have that same question. <laughs> you know, we're, we're still working on, on answering it. So. Other thoughts on that? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I think Bridget covered it really well. Um, and the, you know, the thing is, there's, it's a, it's a, it's a really relevant question because putting in all of these, uh, you know, green infrastructure practices and such, people are going to be wondering what's the life of these before I need to do some form of remediation in that area and pull all that media out? Do I have to send it to a hazardous waste facility? That type of thing. So, um, and it's it's really going to uh, make a difference what chemicals are in your, in your um, catchment. So whatever's draining into your, uh, your GI practice uh, is going to determine uh, what you have to do with the remains of it. And so it's a it it it's an important issue because it could mean a big difference in your GI infrastructure budget, right? So if you have to send it to hazardous waste facilities, that's expensive. Um, but if they degrade on site, that's fantastic, right? And then it's doing a better job. And PFAS coming into the picture makes the problem um, a whole lot bigger. Uh, and I think we're only really just starting to talk about PFAS and stormwater. It's largely been considered a groundwater and drinking water problem for many years, but um, there is starting to be, um, you know, discussion of what we can do to manage PFAS in runoff as well. And it's starting to be seen as a, a important vector for transporting these compounds to receiving waters. And the, the thing about the, the PFAS is there the, the forever chemicals. And even though some of the so-called precursor compounds can degrade, they become these terminal perfluoral alkyl acids that also aren't degrading under ambient environmental conditions. And um, at least as far as I'm aware, we do not have the technology to install some sort of fungi into these systems and degrade them at this point. Although I know that that's an area of active research and somebody might have found it out and not published it yet. Um, but that is where the, you know, thinking about regeneration and, um, you know, treatment of the media within the system is important. And it becomes complicated when you're mixing your media in with the sand to, to regenerate it. So one, one way of thinking might be how we design our systems to enable a regeneration of the media rather than needing to um, just dispose of it. And, and is that economically viable? So, yeah. Other thoughts on that vein? Just one thought, you know, it, I don't get involved as a lot, but a lot of a lot of people in my company do. But it 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 does come down to you know who's making the decisions uh, for the maintenance, right? So it's oftentimes cities and uh, watershed districts <clears throat> if they don't have guidance on what to do, um, and if NPC doesn't have rules that say you can or cannot dispose in this way, then that's how it's going to be done. So. I, I'm a, you know, I, I think there's a lot more maintenance out there than most cities and districts can handle, and layering on additional complexity, I think, is is challenging without some kind of guidance. So I think that has to be developed before, um, you know, it even can be considered. I think, what to do with these chemicals. Well, and for me, it, it sounds like you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we don't have the information to be able to set what that guidance should be yet, right? We still need more research. We need still to understand. I even think about the complexity of, of binding 
these chemicals on a media, right? There's going to be competition and interactions once it's on the media as well. So I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions, obviously areas for research, as John said, uh, we all have <laughs> our work cut out for us to, to do work on this area for a long time, I think. Um, any thoughts before I kind of pivot to a very practical question for our group? Just a quick one, I'll, I guess, following up on the, the media and, and the research stuff uh, is, I was gonna try to text uh, Mike Trojan aside, but I was gonna go to everybody, but um, Greg, uh, I've read some of your work and we've discussed it years ago about the rise of poor, I, some stuff that I'm not gonna be able to pronounce right now, but you know, mycelium assisted breakdown of PAHs during plant uptake and whatnot. And uh, I know that there's still probably not that much research on that, but I think that uh, I was recommending that pretty heavily to MPCA management as a PAH potential uh, mitigation project research uh, before I left, which was maybe looking at different, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the sort of sediment berms that have been placed in some places, but, you know, trying to assist uh, some breakdown instead of just burying pH contaminated sediments from ponds, but looking at some assessments to maybe assist uh, the actual degradation of those compounds. And as Bridget mentioned, there's some issues with transformation products, but uh, I don't know, I'm just going to throw in that brainstorming idea into the mix for anybody that's going to consider <laughs> PAH work in Minnesota in the future, especially MPCA. Well, I know uh, <laughs> Greg Lefebvre actually is getting referenced several times, so I'm going to drop actually a link to his uh, website at the University of Iowa. Uh, he's a researcher, was in the University of Minnesota, uh, did some graduate work here and, and did great work, and he's gone on to do some, some really interesting work and very good papers on this topic. So if anybody's interested, um, I encourage you to check out his website and his references. Uh, he's an expert on this topic as well, and he very well could be a panelist on this uh, topic today. I'm going to I'm going to pivot into a very practical question for for and from stormwater practitioners and it's still related to the media and, and how we might design stormwater treatment practices to remove these chemicals. Uh, the question specifically is what is the expected price range for stormwater treatment materials uh, i'm assuming specifically media things like that so things like iron things like biochar even activated carbon or commercially available products, uh, proprietary products, for example. So if any of our panelists have a sense of what those costs are or even a cost range, I think our stormwater practitioner audience would really benefit from some ideas there. And obviously it's gonna depend on the material, but if we can give a little bit of input. Um, I think that could be helpful. I, I don't have costs. Um, to give you, but I can say that the, the media cost is typically not the driving factor. It's typically the land, construction, engineering, design, all the stuff that goes into the building of the, the BMP. So the media is tip in, in the active part of the media, which is you know, iron, aluminum, or whatever, whatever kind of thing you use, combined with some kind of uh, something to hold it, granite sand, whatever sand, is not the biggest cost, um, you know, it's it's typically the footprint, the power, or whatever, you know, it's the construction and maintenance. And I would say the biochar market is not really established enough to give a good estimate of costs um, because it, at this point it's not, you know, it just it completely depends on the scale that the producer is um, producing at, and there's just not enough large you know producers producing at that scale to really market a project product specifically for stormwater and compete at that level to really establish a market price. So I think that um, I can do the political dance around the answer to that question and say, um, you know, what, what we really need are more clear specifications for materials to be used for these applications and standardized ways to certify them so companies and providers can start to meet those specifications and compete at a market level to establish this sort of price 
range. So. I think, I think the other thing to keep in mind to, to build on both of those, the things that will affect the cost of the media um, will be availability, right? If you have to truck a material a long distance, that's obviously going to increase the cost if you're looking for a very specific material. Um, and as Bridget said, if, you know, if, if, if the market, if there's not a lot of products on there, then price really isn't set. It can kind of be um, variable and dependable. And again, it's going to depend on, on where you're at and how far it's coming and um, but as, as Keith said, I, that's been my experience as well on some of these media amendments. Uh, it's a relatively low percentage of the overall cost, but it can become expensive if you're looking for something specific or you need to, to travel a long distance to get it to your site. Or if the particular site is difficult or if there's something about your site that's going to increase cost the contractors aren't familiar with. For example, mixing a media with sand, iron in sand or biochar in sand, if you need to do mixing on site, that can make things expensive as well. So other comments on cost practicality. All right, so I'm gonna dive into another question we have from the audience. Again, if you have questions, please post them and we will uh, ask them here. We're gonna go back into um, maybe a, a more challenging question to think about. Uh, and this is again from Mark Ferry, another good question from Mark. So someone who studied these emerging contaminants wondered if we were actually looking at issues that posed a serious environmental concern or if we were looking at more of an environmental hygiene issue. Uh, this gets a little bit back to toxicity. So for example, Steve covered the state of the art for risk assessment for chemicals we are finding, but many or most maybe don't have a demonstrated toxicity or don't have necessarily a connected impact to water resources, if I can add a little bit to the question. So where do you think we are in discerning between the two? Where, where are the major concerns here? Uh, when we're talking about some of these chemicals. Again, with the caveat, there's a lot of chemicals involved and it's going to depend a little bit on where you're at and what chemicals you're talking about. But comment on this question about where's the balance between environmental concern, toxicology, risks assessment, and maybe an environmental hygiene concept. Well, I can start us out anyway. So, um... It's a great question, Mark, and super relevant. Uh, and that's why we started this prioritization effort in the first place. That's all these chemicals are out there and we're seeing detections and such, but what do you do about that? So uh, really important to prioritize and try and understand which ones really do have potential for adverse effects. And the answer is always, uh, or is never simple, I should say. Um, and um, it's all going to depend on the site and which chemicals we're talking about, their persistence and um, their behavior, their fate and transport, all that um, obviously comes into play. But some of it might be, you know, what you mentioned, more of a, a kind of environmental chemical hygiene. Um, you know, notice in our studies, we found that 70% of the chemicals didn't really exceed any kind of uh, level of uh, concern. That's the sites that we chose. You go to a different site and you might find a different answer. Um, but one of the things, and maybe I could have chimed in on lessons learned here, this is one thing we found is that depending on which set of benchmarks we look at, if we look at established benchmarks, if we look at some kind of screening level benchmarks, if we look into the literature, um, if we look at the tox cast uh, values, you could get very different concentrations that are considered your concentration of concern. And so um, which one do you trust? Which one do you find to be um, the, you know, to have the least uncertainty, I guess, is a question. I, it's all really a work in progress. Even when you look at um, established benchmarks around the world. We look at Canadian benchmarks, US benchmarks, European benchmarks, state-by-state -state benchmarks. 
you can get several orders of magnitude difference in what people are calling their concentration of concern. So, um, so there's no clear answer, obviously, and I think Mark understands that well. Um, but um, I think some of the chemicals will rise to a point where, yeah, this is a problem. And a lot of the chemicals, probably the majority of them, will not be a, a huge issue as far as direct toxicity. And then there's the second question of, yeah, okay, if, so it's not, it's not a easily measured toxicity. Are there low level stresses like Keith mentioned uh, earlier? And uh, would they have more of a long-term effect instead of a short-term effect, which is a lot easier to measure, so. Other thoughts on that? I'll jump in um, quickly, leave some room for somebody else if that's okay. But um, I think just to echo what Steve said, it definitely seems like it's part of that discernment um, that Mark mentioned, you know, is hopefully being uh, aided by this combination of, you know, more rapid response type of bioassays that can, you know, assess changes to biological mechanisms that have been linked with outcomes as opposed to necessarily doing, you know, life cycle length assessments of, you know, mammals and fish and whatnot um, that take a lot longer to get results. And sometimes, you know, might not, sh you know, if you can show that enough, you know, chemicals or whatever mechanisms activated, it's just, you have to have the strength of that linkage of that adverse outcome pathway established. And that's obviously a work in progress. Um, but, and I guess also as you were, I'll, you know, we're well aware that for certain chemicals, you know, that they're a similar class, you know, we might be safe to do this kind of quantitative structure activity relationship or some rough estimates of additive toxicity, you know, for various classes of flame retardants or various types of pesticides. Um, so even if we don't have, you know, studies on every degradate or, you know, triazine, like you know, we've got atrazine, but we maybe don't have studies on a bunch of other triazines, you know, you can still sort of make these estimates using some sort of sentinel chemicals. Um, but it's obviously a big work in progress. And, um, and I think as Steve mentioned, too, there's lots of different values out there. And it's it, right, it's still not, there's not like a really like high throughput way of doing it. I mean, comp tox and ecotox and some of these um, databases are, are starting to establish that where you can actually just blast your concentrations and get back these toxicity numbers that, you know, five years ago, you would have had to go and like dig through each paper yourself and decide what, you know, the biological relevance of the species of concern and all that stuff. So, I mean, it's being advanced, but it's obviously a, a really huge effort and a work in progress. Um, and coming from a background in, in analytical chemistry, I like to try to think about coming at this from the reverse direction, instead of thinking, okay, what, what compounds that we know about, that we know exist might be toxic, test to see if they're toxic and then look for them in the water. What about different approaches to more qualitatively screen for what is there and prioritize compounds that we know um, are present in the water for testing for toxicity and then including in these, um, these monitoring assessments. So there are emerging analytical approaches called non-target analysis where you can Instead of designating a contaminant list, you can try to screen for whatever contaminants are detectable. So you don't get a concentration out of it, but you can say, you know, from your data, you can derive and say, okay, we suspect that this contaminant is present. And, you know, another one thing that drives adding these compounds to the analytical methods is the presence of their standard reference material. So, you know, coming at it from an approach of, you know, prioritizing compounds, not only that we suspect to be ecologically harmful, but also that we have information that they exist in the environment. And another um, strength of an approach like that is, you know, sometimes we don't know there's contaminants, these contaminants exist because they're formed from other chemicals in the environment. And we don't always get the opportunity to see the effect and try to deduce what the contaminant was, because usually there's so many different contaminants coming together to cause 
um, a more uh, chronic effect. However, um, many of you may have heard about 6-PBD quinone in the news um, and the work from Ed Kologi's group at University of Washington. And what, what they, the, their whole project started out not with, we're gonna look for this particular compound, 6-PBD quinone. The, the origination of their project was the coho salmon are dying when they're exposed to road runoff but when that road runoff filters like filters through soil, they're not dying. So they wanted to figure out what, what is it that was causing that acute effect. So they actually used that approach called non-target screening, and they compared extracts from fish who were um, dying and fish that weren't to try to deduce what, what compounds were actually causing that. And, they're, um, yeah, they were able to narrow it down to a list of a potential class of compounds. And then it sort of became a picking and testing <laughs> approach after that. And, and eventually they, they found that this compound 6-PPD quinone that we didn't know existed, um, it's formed from a compound in tires that is meant to preserve the rubber that rubs off and then degrades once it's in the environment to become an acutely toxic compound. So, so I'm going back to, to transformation products here. And you know, if, if we don't know that the compound exists, we can't put it through these screening assays. So it's, it's a good approach to try to come at it from both directions, especially as those non-target um, approaches are becoming more established. Other thoughts on that? So I want to take another question. We actually have a good question here from Mike Trojan. It actually uh, builds very well off of what Bridget was just saying. And it's, it's actually related to infiltration of stormwater. So as we continue to push infiltration of stormwater, what are your thoughts on this? Research that Mike has seen uh, suggests relatively low concentrations, I'm assuming in groundwater at this point but maybe we will load up the groundwater over time, or maybe we're allowing dilution and greater resonance times for nature to be able maybe to take care of some of these chemicals. So this gets to transformation, it gets to long-term buildup. Um, I think about road salt as a, as a corollary there, right? We've been using road salt for decades now and we're seeing in our groundwater supplies decades later. Is that the problem we might expect to see decades from now with some of these CECs? So what are your thoughts on groundwater, infiltrating stormwater, and what might happen to some of these chemicals? Our audience has too difficult questions, too many difficult questions for our panel. <laughs> and I, I, I'll jump in because this is, this is, I guess, I don't want to dominate the conversation here, but it's sort of going off of what I was just talking about. Um, you know, we can, there's been, a decent amount of research on this actually for more of the Western US looking at managed aquifer recharge for addressing their water scarcity issues. So that has largely been seen as um, since we're not trying to essentially uh, recharge our aquifers with our runoff to address water scarcity, there hasn't been a lot of research here. But um, there are techniques sort of similar to the stormwater infiltration, except at a much larger scale, essentially. So um, they're actually putting filter media in these managed aquifer recharge systems to remove contaminants. But I see that um, Mark's question wasn't necessarily about adding filter media to remove those contaminants. It was if these contaminants are degrading over time and um, you know maybe for some but not for contaminants like PFAS. So what what we want to avoid essentially is um, needing to remediate the groundwater because that's um, much more challenging and expensive than just treating the stormwater up front. So um, again it, also though I would say it it depends because um, you know if if the compounds that are in the runoff are relatively degradable, then the 
the treatment might not be necessary. So that's my take on it. And I hope it touches on what, what Mark was asking about. So. Other thoughts? So yeah, I, I guess um, it's right. So it, if you, uh, you have a GI system and infiltration base and what have you, and you have these chemicals that are introduced to it, some of them are gonna make it through and be um, introduced into the groundwater system. Um, you know, uh, actually a study I was just looking at this week was done in Minnesota. Sarah, Sarah Elliott is the uh, primary author from USGS and showed a significant reduction in concentrations um, in the groundwater system. Uh, certainly there's something to do with dilution there, like, like Mike said. And, uh, but then I don't know that there's enough data to know whether there's going to be an accumulation. It really depends on the groundwater flow system, you know, how quickly it's moving, uh, how much dilution there is, and how quickly these contaminants are being introduced into the groundwater system. Um, but certainly, uh, some of the contaminants are being removed and all of them aren't being introduced into the groundwater system. So then there's that balance of how much is too much. Um, so yeah, a lot of work to be done on that, but it's a good question. And I would, I would imagine the mineralogy of the ground, uh, the soils, right, is going to have, a, could have a big impact too. So there's interactions there that we might not be even aware of. Other thoughts on groundwater, stormwater infiltration, fate and transport. I'll just chime in quick. Um, so sort of, like you said, the mineralogy of the subsurface, uh, but yeah, the, the physical chemistry of the various contaminants too, like a Bridget mentioned PFAS uh, chemicals that uh, are mobile, you know, and through different media. Um, and persistent, um, you know, maybe you have more of a risk there. Um, people might be familiar with the concept of uh, pseudo persistence has been mentioned for like degradable compounds in surface waters like caffeine or whatever, but there's continual low level inputs. And so even though they're breaking down, uh, they're replenished, you know, obviously the time scales and all the processes for groundwater are much different. And so something like caffeine, I don't think you're probably going to have this long term issue. Um, but PFAS or things like that, that can reach groundwater, you know, that aren't being absorbed by the soil as strongly and then can persist there. Um, and that's why you see them showing up in, in groundwater, you know, already in places. But, you know, again, and, you know, the concentrations might be lower, but then you have to compare them to drinking water standards too, and things like that, you know, or human health metrics a little more directly. And especially with, with PFAS and the new EPA guidance on um, essentially recommending no detectable level that becomes very complicated even if so even if they're at low levels you know what do you if you can detect them do we still care and should we be concerned so other thoughts So we have another, we have a couple more questions from our online audience. Again, if you, uh, if you have questions, get them in. We're gonna wrap up here in another few minutes, but we have a couple, we have time for a little bit more question. Uh, the question here uh, actually comes from Katya. And the question is, how would you combine the different contaminants into an overall toxicity score or maybe toxicity, we can use a different word for toxicity. Um, for example, categorical sediment toxicity status, good, fair, poor or maybe a more quantitative measure? Uh, and would that be first sight, site by site, or um, could we make that more generalized? So what would you say on that based on your experience looking at these chemicals? How do you come up with kind of an aggregate or overall uh, score for these systems? I'm trying to wait for uh, some of the other panelists to chime in because this is a hard question. <laughs> so I don't have an answer. Yeah. 
It is, but I think you did a little bit of it. I, mean, I don't know if you want to discuss the exposure activity relationships or anything that you presented, um, if that's a starting point or, or not. Yeah, that's obviously what we've been doing. All of these um, methods that we're using are more prioritization methods than, than real definitive um, toxicity assessments, right? So um, we're trying to, and, and I guess you saw in the bar chart that I presented that you have these stacked bars with the different chemical classes. That's kind of a brute force way to do it. It's not um, it's not rocket science to take, you know, to take those um, hazard quotients and stack them on top of each other uh, to get kind of a feel for how many chemicals and each chemical, how, how much impact it has. It's not a true mixtures analysis by any stretch. That's just a, you know, kind of a, like I said, a brute force way to um, take a, uh, an initial look at that. But that could be used as some form of a um, good, fair, poor assessment, or more, more so a comparison among sites. Um, so I don't know. There's a lot of different ways people have done it. I don't think there's any perfect way. They all have their pitfalls and they all have their, uh, they all have their, um, pros. So. Other thoughts on that? I just want to point out there are you know, some models out there, they're not for these models, these chemicals, but the biotic ligand model that exists for, for metals. So there are some attempts to aggregate different chemicals and uh, add up their potential toxic effect. When I do my uh, analysis of very complex wastewater, I may do multi, multivariate logistic regression on those. So each parameter has some kind of coefficient and score. Um, which changes depending upon the wastewater I'm using, but I think there are ways to integrate them, but it takes a lot of testing. I think no, we just, have a lot of variables. Go ahead, David, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And some of these bioassays, I think, again, are, are methods to, you know, attempt, and we're still tying that together, but, um, you know, I think one of the answers is hopefully um, by looking at sort of like you know, Bridget mentioned unsupervised non-target analyses, like some of these, there's unsupervised bioassays like RNA transcriptomics, where you just, you know, you're measuring the entire uh, transcriptome uh, that an organism is producing. And you can look at changes globally um, based on exposures to mixtures. And, um, you know, if you can pair those and get a strong enough correlation between, you know, some of these changes in, in organisms based on those exposures, you know, I think part of the hope is that that, that will, demonstrate the toxicity you know what i mean in a way that's really tangible um and that if it's consistent enough then you might you know start to track like you know maybe not just the total chemical concentrations or the total number of features in an on-target analysis but start to look at you know like the commonly um contributing chemical components to you know but definitely a work in progress and i think that's one of the big hopes from the sort of spearhead of these types of bioassays Well, then there's, uh, there's one more question from the audience, which I think is a great segue into our, our closing. We're going to close uh, after this question uh, with our final thoughts as well. But the, the question now is, so what would be your suggestions for critical research needs? Uh, to use maybe a poor but related pun, we're just dipping our toes <laughs> into this topic, right? We're just starting. There's a, there's a wide open, a lot of things that we could do. But what would you say, in your personal opinion, uh, are the critical research needs regarding these chemicals and stormwater? What do you think our next steps we should be? To, to reiterate um, and not to dominate the discussion, but um, I think context for one thing, it's been alluded to, Keith mentioned, you know, conventional parameters. Um, a lot of studies that look at CECs don't always include metals and other things that can you know, be stressors and getting some kind of context with that um, sort of more well understood stressors is a great idea. Um, and I think another critical need is like the non-target analysis that Bridget mentioned, like, you know, being able to develop the libraries so that people can identify chemicals, you know, that are detected. Cause a lot of times, you know, the feature, you know, it's where it's 
um, responding on the analytical, you know, response retention time, et cetera. But um, sometimes the actual identification is not there yet. And as more and more efforts put into populating those databases, it'll be the information that you can derive from such non unsupervised methods will be a lot more robust and might hold more promise than developing just methods to analyze the next thousands of chemicals, you know, with targeted methods that we produce and, and discover in the environment. That's great, David. Thanks. Go ahead. David took my answer, so. <laughs> But, but that, um, yeah, ahead. I can, you know, I guess we're, we only have two minutes, two minutes left, but also time, just reiterating, ahead. like trying to take that look, come at the problem from, from both sides and um, also try to look at it from the context of screening to see what's there to inform the monitoring list. So we're better choosing our target lists based on what we might actually expect to see at higher levels. Just mentioned two things. First of all, we could talk all day on that question um, or and more. And second, um, for me, there's a big gap in what toxicology data is available for a lot of these chemicals. So that's a that's a big critical research need is to fill in the ones that were having high detection rates, prioritize those for toxicity testing. So Keith has uh, job security. Any other critical research needs or knowledge gaps on this topic? Fine, you got me one more is, is um, I'm not sure if it's a research need, but I think driving like the, the um, importance of the question, you know, I mean, we don't need to like try to make it seem like the sky is falling, but being able to um, convey whatever the, the need the importance of that to the public, you know, because uh, it's, you know, which uses the term decision makers before, but ultimately the public is the drives the decision making, uh, hopefully. And, you know, um, so I think conveying that need uh, to help generate momentum towards understanding it, you know, is also a need. For sure. All right, well, we are going to move to our closing question for our panelists. Uh, what I'm gonna ask is what are your key takeaways from today? What would you like to either re-emphasize or highlight from our discussion or what other key takeaway do you want our audience to walk away with today? We're gonna go in the same order that we did our introductions. Um, so we're gonna start with David. What are your key takeaways today? Uh, that the study that, that Steve presented, which is a part of you know a multifaceted study and um, is a great thing to look into if you wanna understand what's going on with kind of combining these chemical, broad chemical assays along with other aspects of looking at toxicology to relate uh, the environmental effects of chemical mixtures. Um, so thanks for presenting that to an audience that, you know, um, hopefully was, you know, receiving it with great interest. Um, and I guess the other thing is that, yeah, these chemicals are present and, you know, they're in stormwater and, um, I guess one of the needs that I didn't mention, or you know, I think that's alluded to as well, even by your presentation, is the you know the context of stormwater with the context of other sources, you know, and um, stormwater volumes are massive, and so even if the concentration, you know, there's some chemicals that are occurring like they're they're loading from stormwater is definitely equivalent or greater than that from treatment plants, for example, and um, you know it's an important topic. So I guess that's <laughs> the general takeaway. That's great, David. Bridget, what would you give as key takeaways? Uh, yeah, I, I could say a lot of different things, but I think I'm going to go with my point on biochar and that not all biochars are equal. And to if you are in, interested in using biochar to treat CECs and stormwater, to take the time to test a couple different materials and make sure what you're selecting is appropriate for your needs. So that'll be my takeaway for today. That's great. And I think I think that's relevant to anything. Anything that you want to treat, uh, use as a media to treat for pollutants, uh, test it, try it, make sure it works, and find something that does if it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. And maybe also just reiterating the importance of non-target analysis and screening assessments as complementary to conventional monitoring efforts as well. Definitely I, another important uh, take. So I gave two, sorry. That's okay. No, that's good. I think that's good. I think it's good to highlight that because I, I feel like those non-target 
uh, methodologies are really going to carry us into the future, right? Because there's, again, we're always going to find things we didn't expect um, mm -hmm. and maybe even things we didn't even know about. So Keith, what would be your key takeaways from today? Uh, my key takeaway was broadcasting. I, yeah. I think uh, connecting research uh, and government agencies to uh, the practitioners on the ground is really important uh, task. And especially this one where I think a lot of people know about it, but don't exactly know uh, how to proceed. So thank you for this presentation today. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, the technology transfer is a key piece, right? We can do all the research we want and we can publish all the papers we want, but if it can't get to practitioners or if, or if we can't translate it in ways that everybody can understand and use and implement, um, then we're really not doing anything. So Steve, you get the last word. What would be your key takeaways from our discussion today? Okay, well, first of all, it's been great being in front of this audience. This is a exactly the kind of audience we need to get this information to, the stormwater professionals. And um, I just uh, feel like all the work we've done, you know, in these last 10 years or so uh, makes me understand that the problem is super complex, but it's approachable. It, it seems overwhelming to start with, but with proper prioritization, we can reduce the list down to the critical chemicals and understand which ones have the greatest in, uh, potential for uh, adverse impacts. And from that, we can work with stormwater professionals to formulate a plan to deal with the problem. And so, you know, this audience is the, really the perfect audience to bring this information to. And um, uh, I'm hoping that this might spark a little something, a uh, few thoughts in their minds um, for uh, designing effective management uh, for our future. That's great, Steve. I can't, I can't say anything better. So I will thank you for joining us today for the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. I wanna thank our keynote speaker, Steve Corsi, for setting the stage, giving us great wisdom on what's been done and what's out there and what we can do with it. I want to thank our local panel experts, David Fairbairn, Bridget Ulrich, and Keith Pilgrim for serving on the panel and providing us wisdom as well from the local and even now national perspective. Um, and I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us today and making this seminar series possible. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.